what we're going to do in this video is delve into a bit of real analysis and present the construction of the real numbers based upon the idea of Dedekind cuts. Just to remind you of what we did last time, and also the general theme for the last few videos in constructing number systems, uh, what we did last time is we constructed the set of rational numbers, Q, by considering some Cartesian product, in this case, Z times Z prime, where Z is a set of all integers, and Z prime is the set of all integers excluding zero. And what we did is we partitioned this Cartesian product according to some equivalence relation. In the case of constructing the rational numbers, what we did is we said that two order pairs AB is going to be equivalent to CD if and only if A times D is equal to B times C. And just to emphasize once more is when we set up this equivalence relation, we utilize the arithmetic that we set up on the lower order set. That's to say that when we construct the rational numbers, we're utilizing integer arithmetic to say that these two order pairs are equivalent. And just like our previous constructions, uh, this has a very nice visual interpretation. We construct this grid, and we represent that, or we take that as a representation of this Cartesian product z times z prime, and we say that tilde is going to partition this grid into the rational numbers. So, for example, the rational number four is going to be the listing of all of the order pairs, such as four one, and all of its equivalent order pairs. Now, the rational numbers are quite nice in their own right, and for most on non-theoretical calculations, this is pretty much all you need. You just need the rational numbers. Nonetheless, as everyone learns in their math education, there are these certain quantities, such as the square root of 2, pi, and e, which make themselves known by not being able to be represented as a ratio of two integers. That's to say, if these quantities exist at all, they're going to be irrational numbers. And the square root of 2 was, it's a very popular case, so it was discovered very early on by the Greeks. Uh, you just form the square root of 2, the supposed quantity of the square root of 2, just by considering the diagonal of a square with a unit length. And of course, pi shows up in circles, and e is going to show up as a base of natural logarithms. And the informal description of what's going on here is that if you consider the continuum, or the entire number line, so to speak, the set of rational numbers has gaps in the irrationals. That's to say, we know of rational numbers which are again, informally speaking, to the left of the square root of 2 and to the right of the square root of 2. Uh, just take the number 1, for example, that squares to 1. And the number 2, the rational number 2, squares to 4. So we know the square root of 2 is going to be bounded on the left by 1 and on the right by 2. So the square root of 2 is going to be somewhere between 1 and 2, if it exists at all. And you can do similar arguments with pi and e. You can give bounds. You can give rational number bounds for what these two values are going to be, if you can, assuming you can write them down exactly. Now, besides having gaps in the irrational numbers, uh, this set Q suffers from another shortcoming. That is, it's possible to make subsets of Q, which are bounded above by a rational number, yet not have a least upper bound. And let me sort of explain those terms in case you're not familiar with those. So what I mean here by bounded above, that is, this subset has an upper bound. What I mean by that is that I can pick a rational number which is greater than or equal to all the numbers in this subset that we're considering. So that's just what an upper bound means. And a supremum, or a least upper bound, as the name suggests, is the least of all the upper bounds that I could consider. So the supremum is still going to be greater than or equal to all the numbers in some set, but it's going to be the least of all the upper bounds I could consider. And hopefully uh, this will be clearer through examples. So let me consider this set S, and this is clearly a subset of Q, subjected to the property that the members are, of S are going to have squares less than 2. All right, so, so I claim that S has numerous upper bounds in Q. And what I mean by that is I can just very easily pick rational numbers which are greater than or equal to all of the stuff in S. And one easy example of that is the, the rational number 2 because 2 squared is 4, and that tells me just by rational number arithmetic that all the stuff in S is going to be less than 2. So 2 is an upper bound for the set S, and 2 is obviously a rational number. But Q is not going to have a supremum. And I won't prove this statement analytically, but I'll sort of show you the, the intuition behind it. 
So this subset of Q is not going to have a least upper bound, which is a rational number. And sort of what's going on here computationally, I can start listening out all of the upper bounds of S coming from the right, approaching the supposed square root of two. For example, I know three is an upper bound. I said before that two is an upper bound. And I can keep considering rational numbers, which are slightly less than the previous one I just said. Like, so I'm at two here. Three over two is slightly less than two. Three over two is still going to be an upper bound because uh, three over two squared is still greater than two. And I can keep going to the left, just inching my way to the left, approaching the square root of two. I can consider numbers like 143 over 100. This is still going to square to something greater than two. And I keep inching my way to the left, approaching the square root of two. So I can consider 142 over 100 or 1415 over 1000. And it turns out that you can't ever specify the last or the least upper bound among this list. So this list goes on forever. And what that means is that this set S has no least upper bound, which is a rational number. And uh, as an exercise, I challenge you to find an algorithm which will give you the next number on this list. For example, if I tell you, okay, the last number I, I think would be 1415 over 1000, can you specify an algorithm which gives you a rational number which is less than that one, yet still squares to something greater than two? That is, it's still an upper bound for S. And if you can show that this list goes on and on forever, then there's no least upper bound here. And it turns out that this supremum property or the lack of the supremum property for the set of rational numbers puts you in a really awkward position for doing things like calculus or, or continuous analysis because it prevents you from proving theorems like the intermediate value theorem. And of course, the intermediate value theorem, it's, it's very intuitive when you see it in the calculus course. But the lack of the supreme property prevents you from proving that theorem. And you need this theorem in term to prove things like the mean value theorem and also to prove that functions take on max or min values on an interval. So you basically have a very difficult time doing calculus or continuous analysis just by considering the rational numbers alone. So this is another sort of motivation for extending the rational numbers into the real numbers. Now, there are a few ways of trying to construct the real numbers. In other words, trying to add on these extra irrational numbers to the rational numbers. Uh, one such method is to consider equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. That is to define a particular real number as an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences, where the sequences are going to be said to be equivalent if they approach the same limit. For example, if you consider these two sequences, they both approach two. And so both of these sequences would be members of the set two. And just as this quick five second summary of what a Cauchy sequence is. It's a special sort of converging sequence where in addition to these, the sums, the partial sums getting arbitrarily close to a limit, these terms also get arbitrarily close to one another. And if you're interested in that, I encourage you to uh, look into that a little bit more. The only problem is with this sort of construction using Cauchy sequences is that the arithmetic is very, very difficult. You have a very difficult time setting up very simple statements concerning real number arithmetic. Uh, another sort of construction of the real numbers involves infinite decimals. And this is very much in line with our uh, everyday thinking of real numbers as uh, sort of infinite decimals. The decimals would just go on forever. Like the square root of two, if you write the decimal expansion or, or even pi, those are gonna go on forever and they don't repeat. But these two ideas are very much related because what we mean really symbolically when we write decimals is really sequences. Sometimes they go on forever, sometimes they repeat, sometimes they terminate. And the, the main or canonical theoretical construction of the real numbers involves things which are called Dedekind cuts. Now what a Dedekind cut is, it's going to be a definition of a real number based upon some special subset of the rational numbers. Now basically what Dedekind's idea was he said that if you have a even a irrational number, which corresponds to a gap in the rational numbers, you can define up that number as a real number just by giving all of the rational numbers to the left 
of that particular number on the number line. That's sort of the informal description of what's going on here. For example, if you want to consider something like the square root of 2, you want to consider this real number, which supposedly squares a 2. What you would do is you would give a description of all of the rational numbers, which are to the left of this approximate location on the number line. So he, he was saying that, yeah, there's a gap there, but you can define up this number just by giving me the list of all of the rational numbers, which are to the left of this. And the precise definition of the square root of 2 in this case, as a Dedekind cut, would be all of the rational numbers, so this is going to be a subset of q, it's going to be all the rational numbers that either have squares less than 2, so automatically we have the numbers from approximately there to about there, or they're less than 0. So that's what's going to give us all of the rational numbers to the left of the supposed square root of 2. So this would be the visual representation of a Dedekind cut. That's basically the intuition behind what's going on with these Dedekind cuts. And to be historically correct, what Dedekind really did was considered the, the real number that you're trying to define as actually cutting the rational number line into some subset going to the left and another subset going to the right. And considering the real number that you're trying to define in relation to those two sets. Yeah, so that's the informal way of putting Dedekind cuts. So now that we've sort of understood that, or hopefully understood that, here's the precise definition of what a real number is according to this idea of Dedekind cuts. So we're going to say that a real number is a Dedekind cut, let's call it X, which is going to be a special sort of subset of the rational numbers with the following three properties. First, that the Dedekind cut has to have something in it. It can't be equal to the empty set, and it can't have everything. It can't have all of the rational numbers in it. Secondly, it's got to be closed downward, and informally what that means is that it extends to the left forever. That's to say, if I discover some rational number in, Q, in X, and I have some other rational number R, which is less than Q, then that implies that R is also an X. And hopefully you can see why that implies that the Dedekind cuts are going to extend to the left infinitely. And thirdly, there's no greatest element in X, meaning that as you inch your way toward the right on that Dedekind cut, you don't, you don't just stop somewhere. There's no greatest element in this Dedekind cut. And under this definition, the set of all of these Dedekind cuts, of all the possible Dedekind cuts, is the set of all real numbers. And that's designated by R. And in terms of giving an axiomatic treatment of this, since we're considering sets of subsets, all of these Dedekind cuts are going to be found within the power set of Q. Because remember, the power set of Q is just giving me the list of all of the possible subsets of Q. So if Q exists, the power set of Q exists, and the real numbers are just particular instances of members within the power set of Q. So just to make sure we've understood what a Dedekind cut is, uh, I challenge you to go through these two non-examples of Dedekind cuts and show why they're not Dedekind cuts. That is, which of these three criteria do they fail? And uh, let me give you an example of a Dedekind cut. And what I'm going to consider here is the real number representation of two, which is going to be all of the rational numbers which are less than 2, which are less than the rational number 2. Now, to show that this real number representation of 2 is a Dedekind cut, we're going to have to uh, verify the three criteria. First, we're going to have to make sure that this set actually contains something in it. And I could just demonstrate that by example. I see that the rational number 1 is in the set 2, because the rational number 1 is less than the rational number 2. So this is not equal to the empty set. And I can select some rational number which is not in this set. So the rational number 3 is not in this set. And that tells me that this uh, real number 2 is not equal to uh, all of the rational numbers. And it's not equal to the empty set. So in terms of that first criterion, uh, we're fine there. Secondly, we're going to have to show that it's closed downward, that this set is closed downward. So let's suppose that I have some rational number q in this set, 
and that some other rational number, p, is going to be less than q. And the argument goes as follows. If q isn't 2, then that implies that q is less than the rational number 2. And if p is also less than q, just by the properties of the rational numbers, this implies that p is also less than 2. And since p is less than 2, it's also in this set. So we got from this proposition here that q is in 2 and p is less than q to p is in 2. So this set would be closed downward. It extends to the left infinitely far. And thirdly, we're going to have to show that this set has no greatest element. And the argument for that goes as follows. So suppose we, we found the greatest element, g, in this set. Now observe through the following calculation, which is basically taking the average of the rational number 2 and this supposed g, that g wasn't the greatest element. That is, I can always find some other rational number between g and 2, just by averaging the 2. And this is basically the argument behind the, the density of the rational numbers. So g wasn't the greatest element, which means that this set has no greatest element. So we've just verified that this set is indeed a perfectly good Dedekind cut. And based upon our definition of real numbers as Dedekind cuts, this would also be a real number. So let's go back to the example of the, uh, the number square root of 2 being represented as a Dedekind cut. And let's also show that this set, as it's defined, is also a Dedekind cut. So uh, properties 1 and 2, that the square root of 2, this set, is not all of Q, and it has something in it, are pretty clear. And also that it's closed downward is also pretty clear. And the third criterion that we want to show that this set has no greatest element uh, is a little less clear, but it can still be proven. So to show that uh, this set has no greatest element, again, we're going to suppose that it does have a greatest element. Let's call that G. And we're going to claim that I can always find some other rational number, let's call it H, which is greater than G, yet this number H still has a square less than 2, which would imply that G wasn't really the greatest element. And uh, it's really not obvious how to do this. You sort of have to play around when, with algorithms to calculate square roots of 2 based on, on rational number approximations. But I claim that if you're given some G, such that g squared is less than 2, you can always calculate h through the following algorithm. You just plug in your g here into this formula or this formula, and this will always give you some other rational number h, such that uh, h is greater than g, and h squared is less than 2. So h squared being less than 2 means that it's in this set, and h being greater than g implies that g wasn't really the least upper bound. There are, sorry, it wasn't really the greatest element in this set. And I leave this to you as an exercise to show that you can actually verify these two statements, h being greater than g and h squared being less than 2 through the following calculation. One really nice thing about Dedekind cuts is that there's a really nice definition for less than uh, when considering Dedekind cuts. That is, if I have two real numbers, x and y, I could say that x is less than y if and only if x is a proper subset of y. And this symbol is going to, to designate proper subset. And proper subset just means that uh, x is a proper subset of y if and only if x is a subset of y and x is not equal to y. So all the members are, of x are going to be in y, but x is not equal to y, meaning that there's still something in y which is not an x. So that's going to be a proper subset. And visually what this is saying is that, let's say I have the real number 2 represented as a Dedekind cut on this number line, so it's going to be starting there. And it's going to extend to the left infinitely far. Now, informally, we want to say that, yeah, 0 represented by a Dedekind cut is less than 2. And 0 is going to be represented in this fashion. It's going to extend infinitely far to the left. And you can see here that 0 this red line is a proper subset of the blue line in the sense that everything on the red line is on the blue line, but there's some stuff on the blue line which is not in the red line, which means that the red line is a proper subset of the blue line, which would mean that 0 
the real number zero is a proper subset of two. And based upon this definition, we would say that, yeah, zero is less than two because zero is a proper subset of two. Now we can also show that the trichotomy law holds for real numbers. That, and just to remind you what that is, it's saying that if you take these three propositions that X is a proper subset of Y or X is less than Y, Y is less than X and X is equal to Y, that one and only one of the three propositions holds for any two arbitrary real numbers, X and Y. So you pick your two favorite real numbers and one and only one of the three propositions is true. And just like we saw before, if you assume that more than one is true, if you assume that two of these three or three of the three propositions are true, then you get contradictions. So this means that either zero of the three propositions is true, or just one is true at any given time. And we want to show that one proposition is true at any given time. So the way to do that is we're going to show that if we assume the opposite of this first proposition and the negation of the third proposition, then this implies the truth of the second proposition. And it turns out from that, you can derive the more general statement, which is that if you assume the negation of that and this, then this implies the truth of this and the other case as well. So this is what we're going to show. So from these two assumptions, the X is not a proper subset of Y and X is not equal to Y. This would imply the following, that the set X minus Y, where I'm talking about relative complement here, not actual subtraction, but the relative complement of X and Y is not empty, which means that there's some number, just based upon the definition of relative complement, there's some number in X, which is not in Y. All right, so since it's not empty, I'm going to consider that number R being an X minus Y. And in addition, I know that the following inference is always true. If I have some rational number Q being in Y and R is less than Q, then it implies that R is in Y. But since R is in X minus Y, that means R is not in Y, and I get th these two proposition propositions through the contrapositive of this statement. So that implies that either R is greater than Q or R is equal to Q. Okay. So R equals Q is false because by assumption, we're gonna say that Q is in Y. So if you just say R is equal to Q, then you can just substitute R and Q there and you get a contradiction. So R equals Q is false. So that means that R not being in Y implies that R is greater than Q. Okay. So if I have R is in X, R is gonna be in X because R is in the relative complement X minus Y. So R is gonna be in X, but not in Y. So we know that R is in X and Q is less than R. And we know this statement just from this inference here. So we have R is in X and Q is less than R. And since X is closed downward, then Q has to be in X. So where did we start and where did we finish? We started with the assumption that Q is in Y. And we concluded that Q is also in X, which tells me that Y is a subset of X. And we also know that X is not equal to Y, which gets us to the conclusion that Y is a proper subset of X, which means we've proven this statement. And as I said before, proving this particular case proves the trichotomy law for the other two cases, where you assume the negation of two of the three propositions and that applies the truth of the third proposition. So the last thing I'm going to prove in this video is the so-called least upper bound property of the real numbers. And this is the sort of property that the rational numbers taken by themselves didn't have. That is, I could consider a subset of the rational numbers and still not have a least upper bound for that subset, which is a rational number. So it's going to turn out that if I take any bounded subset, let's call it A, of the real numbers, this subset is going to have a least upper bound or supremum, which is a real number. So the statement here is all bounded subsets, that is any subset of R which has an upper bound, has a least upper bound, which is also a real number. And it's going to turn out 
that the if I have a collection of real numbers, that, that is, I'm going to have a collection of Dedekind cuts, and I stick the, all those Dedekind cuts into a set A, that the supremum of A is going to be the union of A. And I encourage you to uh, think about why that is just before we go over the proof. Why it is that if you have a collection of Dedekind cuts, that the union of all those Dedekind cuts is going to be the supremum of that set. And the proof isn't actually too bad for this. So we want to show really three things. We want to show that union of A is an upper bound, that is the least upper bound, that is it's a supremum, and thirdly that union of A is a real number, that is it's a Dedekind cut. So let's prove that first statement, that union of A is an upper bound. So if, if union of A is going to be an upper bound, then it should be true that for all x and a, x is less than or equal to union of a. And based upon how we set up this less than relation, this statement here, x is less than or equal to the union of a, is the same thing as saying that x is a subset of the union of a. And this statement is going to be true based upon the definition of union of a. Because remember what this, this statement union of a means, it's the members of the members of a. And so what this statement is saying that all of the members of the members of A, because remember X is itself a member of A, all of the members of the members of A are a member of the member, uh, are a member of some member of A. So you can see that this is just true, that this statement X is a subset of union of A is just true based upon the definition of union of A. So we've just shown that union of A is an upper bound for A. Now we want to show that union of A is the least upper bound, that it's a supremum, or I should say it's the supremum for the subset A. So let's suppose that S is another upper bound and is less than the union of A. So this means that if S is going to be less than the, the union of A, S is going to be, have to be a proper subset of A, just based upon how we're defining less than for two real numbers. So if S is a proper subset of the union of A, just based upon what it means to be a proper subset, there's some rational number Q, which is in the union of A, but it's not in S. Okay? So this would imply that there's a real number in A, which is not a proper subset of S. And hopefully you can see why this is true based upon this proposition and this proposition here. So we know that there's some Q in the union of A, so that means that Q is a member of some member of A, and Q is not a member of S. So that means that there's some uh, real number in the set A, which is not a proper subset of S, meaning that there's something in that particular real number, let's call it X, there's something in X which is not in S. And since X is not a proper subset of S, that means that S wasn't an upper bound at all. So hopefully it's clear that we've reached that contradiction there. And if that's still not clear, uh, make sure you're clear on what it, the union of A means. And also make sure you're clear on what it means to be, for two real numbers to be less than, to, to be in the less than relation with respect to one another. And as an exercise, I encourage you to verify that union of A is indeed a Dedekind cut. Make sure it verifies the, or it satisfies those three properties that we set up for a Dedekind cut. So that'll wrap up this video. So in this video, I just wanted to introduce the idea of Dedekind cut. And what we're going to do next time is work with setting up arithmetic with real numbers using these uh, this idea of Dedekind cuts. So here are the practice problems for this video. And as always, uh, stay tuned for more videos if you enjoyed it. Feel free to subscribe or like the video. And thanks for watching.